Last week we started a series, um, Encounters with Jesus, and we kind of identified there's two ways we're going to look at this series. And first um, is that Jesus encountered similar things that you and I encountered when he came as God in the flesh and, and lived a perfect life. The Bible says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so Jesus walked in our shoes. You know, he's not a God that's far off. He's a God that's near. And, and he walked in our shoes, and, and he, he can sympathize with our weaknesses. Yet he did not sin, so we can grab hope in that, that our Savior did not sin. And then Jesus encountered human emotions. You know, he faced pain and suffering, heartbreak, um, you know, joy. Uh, and tonight we're going to see he was tempted. You know, he was tempted. And so... Uh, Jesus is a sympathetic high priest, and so the encounters with Jesus, we see that. And then the other side of it, too, is we see um, that Jesus encountered individuals. He encountered individuals, imperfect individuals, when he came as God in the flesh to save the world. And, and so he encountered and empowered all types of people, religious, prostitutes, rich, poor, male, female, all different races and ethnicities he encountered uh, when he walked this earth, and, and he dealt with people of all different backgrounds, people that needed restoration. Last week, we looked at Peter, the apostle Peter. He needed restoration, and people that need forgiveness or healing, you know, he, all different backgrounds he, he dealt with, and, and Jesus was intentional, those that he encountered, and in every way, and everyone that he encountered, I mentioned last week, was forever changed, and we'll, we'll see that as we go throughout this series. And so those are kind of two things we want to really take from this as we look at individuals um, encountering Jesus. And so tonight, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 4, that's where we're going to be camping out. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, and uh, we'll get some, some people get you some Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'd love to get you your, your own Bible. We'll even put your name on it um, and, 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 and whatnot. So we're going to be studying the Word tonight. So... And this week, we're going to kind of look at a, a real unusual encounter. Um, if we're, there's not enough Bibles, by the way, to um, maybe share with someone and, and that you came with and give your Bible to someone else just for the, for the, the message. That'd be awesome. And so this is going to be kind of a more unusual encounter. Unlike other in, in, in encounters, uh, like I said, where uh, individuals were forever changed, and met in a profound way by Jesus. Um, G tonight, Jesus comes face to face with spiritual darkness. You know, this passage in Matthew four is uh, what I would call cray cray. It's it's it's. <laughs> I'm glad I got to Addie's heart there. Um, it, it's 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 it always blows my mind. You know, Jesus literally is going to go one on one with the devil, and uh, it's just a, an incredible pas passage. Uh, and it takes place at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's about 30. And so let's read together uh, Matthew 4, 1 through um, 11 there. And it, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Verse 5, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, you shall, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Verse 8, again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone and you shall serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and ministered to him. And so we're going to look at this passage tonight. And, and as Jesus began his ministry, we see he, he went off and prayed and fasted. 
And I just want to camp out real quickly a little bit on fasting. We mentioned it last week, um, but I just kind of want to camp out a little bit on um, before we dive into the rest of the text. You know, I kind of want to just point out, I mean, it says here Jesus prayed and fasted for 40 days. And so we have a Savior that we can identify with. Like I said in the the first part of the encounter series is that he, he fully did a lot of what we do. You know, he walked in our shoes. And he set an example, and he prayed, and he fasted. And in the past eight years, our church has had a week of prayer and fasting. And, and it's been a powerful week. I remember when they first announced it, I kind of thought, man, that's going to be, be kind of boring. What do you do? <laughs> you just kind of sit around, you know, and you eat, and everyone's stomachs grumble. You know, and, but the key is it's prayer and fasting. It's not just starving yourself. Uh, but we get together for three times a day next week. Our, the church, this, this college ministry is a part of Calvary Chapel, and we get together three times a day over meal times, and and just pray and seek the Lord, and, and God shows up. You know, I remember the first year um, thinking, man, I don't know about this. I don't know much about prayer and fasting. The only time I really do it is when I really need something. I don't really need anything right now. I'm not sure, you know, and but it was lit. I mean, it was <laughs> awesome. It was amazing. Like, people were experiencing the Lord in ways I'd never had before. Um, God showed up, and I didn't have an agenda. I didn't have something, you know, I was coming, like, seeking the Lord with this, this, and that. I just came and just got the experience, and, and some of it was just kind of observing and seeing other passionate believers, people seeking God. And every morning, there's over 120 people that come uh, to the, mor- the morning. It's called the morning offering at 6 a.m., and usually it's led by the college students. And so this is our, 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 our plea, our cry to, to fast with us next week, to, to pray about fasting. And I'm going to talk really quickly on what fasting is, but there's, you can, we're going to go in more of the details uh, of, and the logistics of it, too, uh, during announcements, but I'm going to hit on a couple. Um, but, yeah, if you're, if you're wanting to see breakthrough, um, I really believe God wants to, to show up when we set a time, a time aside and just seek him. And, and prayer and fasting is to be part of the Christian life. You know, it, it's crazy. Like Jesus said in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, he, didn't, he said, when you fast, fast like this. When you pray, pray like this. He didn't say if. He said when. It's to be part of what we do as Christians, as a believer. And, and some of you, I think, would really just benefit from just taking this time to set things down. Turn down the dials of your life and just set things aside and seek him for a week. What better way to s- start 2017? And, and what fasting is, it's, it's an intensifier. It's an expression of a spiritual hunger. I desire you, God, more than food. And that's, that's, that's the simplest form of it. And there's different ways uh, that we can uh, uh, express that. You know, maybe it's a meal. Maybe you're fasting from sugar. Maybe it's just eating bland foods. There's, there's things called the Daniel fast. There's different avenues and channels to fast, social media. You know, like there's freedom there. But the heart is that we, we, we set things down, we lay things down at God's feet, and we just say, I'm yours. I want to hear from you. I want to discover what your plan is for my life. I just want to be ministered to. And some of you, you have some big decisions. Maybe you're a senior. you got some big decisions, some, some, some th- crossroads you got to decide. And, and what better? Man, come fast with us. Come pray with us. You know, the week's more, it's really about the prayer meetings. It's really about praying corporately together. You know, being encouraged and praying together. It's, it's a big prayer. It's what, what our pastor calls it is like family camp, you know, with no food. Um, but, again, there's freedom. If some of you need, need to eat and different, different things, we can talk about that. But, um, yeah, it's just a, it's a beautiful thing. And it's been said we use food to meet physical needs, but we also use it to medi- medicate spiritual needs. And so prayer and fasting is expressing with our words and our bellies our hunger for God. And, and that's kind of fasting in a nutshell. And um, it's an incredible tool. And the early church did a corporate fast. Like some of you that might be new, some of you like grew up in the church and you're like, oh, okay, that's cool. I've heard that again. But no, but like that's, you know, that's like, that's crazy. Like if the Lord is your savior, if, if you've received Jesus as your Lord, you're considered a child of God. And, and do you know you have worth and value in his eyes? It doesn't matter what your parents say. It doesn't matter 
what this world pumps at you. You have worth and value. And it says that you're his worksmanship. Ephesians 2 says you're his worksmanship created for good works. He's uniquely created you with a purpose. You know, he's got a call on your life. You're his workmanship. You're handcrafted by God. And often this is the very thing the devil attacks the most. How many of you feel worthless? How many of you feel like devalued or you don't add up? I know I, I relate. I know the attack comes all the time. And we have to battle against that. And, and how do we battle against that? We're going to look at that tonight. And so as the devil came with lies to Jesus, they came in three different forms of temptation. And we just want to look at that really quickly. Look down at verse 3 um, first. He says, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And so the first appeal is um, the appeal to the lust of the flesh. You know, his, his body wanted something. You know, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. He was hungry. A a and the appeal is turn these stones into bread. A and it's this lust of the flesh. And, and, you know, an example of this today would be sexual sin or drunkenness or drug use or gossiping. Or more, um, if you need more ideas, look at Galatians 5. Um, but the, the lust of the flesh, and, and Jesus was vulnerable, and we see that. And then, then in verse 6, the next temptation, look down there. It says, and, then see, and, and he said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, you shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against this stone. And actually before he talks about going to the top of the, the pinnacle of the temple and throwing yourself down. And so this appeals to the pride of life. In, the, in verse 6, the devil asked Jesus to do a public demonstration of power. And what's crazy is we just alluded to it before in, in, in chapter 3, 40 days earlier, Jesus had this public demonstration of power. God Almighty spoke and said, you're my beloved son down from heaven. And there was witnesses. And yet, 40 days later, he's had tack and identity again. And he's saying, hey, you know, like, do this. Show your power. I mean, that would be a, quite the display. It was 200, you know, the temple was over 200 feet above the Kindron Valley. And so that would have been a, an incredible display of, of Jesus doing this in front of, of the city of Israel. And so it's this appeal to the pride of life. And, um. You know, Satan appeals to Jesus with this desire, and, and, and I believe this desire is within every person. We see this, uh, the temptation to attain excess greatness or power um, and public approval. You know, pride is the, the sin that God hates the most, it says. You know, there's so many scriptures throughout the word of God that says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so this is the, the very thing that the enemy attacks of Jesus is, is not uncommon. You know, some examples of this can be desiring to get credit or glory for things that others have done or, or God did. You know, that, that can be an example of that. Or desiring to feel more important than others around us. Or desiring to have power over others in a way that puffs up. And so that was the, the, the next temptation. So we got the, the appeal to the lust of the flesh, the appeal to the pride of life. And the last one, in verse 9, you can see the appeal to the lust of the eyes. And it says, and, and, and he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And so essentially, the devil shows him all the kingdoms and says, I won't go throughout making ruckus anymore. I'll give you this. As if it was his to give. But he says, I'll give you this. He does have freedom to rule and reign in this, this time frame. A and he says, you know, I'll give you this. And it's almost as if he's saying, there's another way. It's deception. There's a shortcut to the cross. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die for humanity. Just worship me right now. Just fall down and worship me. You don't have to die uh, for humanity here and go through all the pain and suffering. And so this, the lust of the eyes is when we cast our eyes upon something with desire, even though God has told us not to look upon those things. A and an example in our culture would be pornography. You know, we live in a, a culture also that's full of instant gratification. Like, I got to have this. Or another thing that we never talk about much, and it's one of the Ten Commandments, is, is coveting. 
Like, if you see someone with a new iPhone 7 Plus, got to have the new iPhone 7 Plus. You know, like, my 6 Plus isn't good enough anymore. You know, there's two cameras on this one. And uh, they're pretty cool. Have you seen the portrait mode? Um, so, yeah, there, there's this, this, the sin of coveting is a prime example of this. And, and it's rarely spoken of. Uh, and, and to covet means to have a strong desire to have something that is rightfully belongs to someone else. And, again, there's ample opportunities throughout the scripture to see people that have fell into coveting. You know, if you need an example, 2 Samuel 11, David and Bathsheba, uh, it's not a great one, but there's an example of coveting another man's wife. Uh, there's all kinds uh, of this that we see, and this is the appeal of the lust of the eyes. And so these three forms, the appeal of the lust of the flesh, the appeal of the pride of life, and the appeal to the lust of the eyes, have been around since the beginning. These, these things have been happening and been tempting us and people before us. And, and actually in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, the first people that walked this earth, God built this beautiful, created this beautiful garden for them, gave them everything, all they needed, uh, and said, just don't, you know, go to this one tree. A- and Jesus said, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in the day if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. But as they lived freely in the garden, the serpent came to them and, and tempted them and attacked God's word and said to Eve, this is what the serpent said in Genesis 3, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open, and as soon as you eat it, you'll be like God and know both good and evil. And so the very thing that God said to avoid, the devil came and attacked and made it sound like it wasn't really that way, he attacked God's character, his word, and was deceptive. And so the devil appealed to Eve by the same three temptations that he appealed to Jesus. In Matthew 4, Genesis 3 says, Eve saw the tree, and it was beautiful. The fruit looked delicious, and that's the lust of the flesh. Or sorry, the lust of the eyes. And then she desired it, and that was the lust of the flesh. And then the pride of life comes in is when the the enemy said, um, you'll have wisdom. She desired wisdom, and that's the pride of life. And so we see the enemy has been tempting and condemning, condemning people since the beginning. Um, but we can find hope in this passage, Matthew 4, we see that Jesus overcame. And how did he overcome? How did he overcome? And that's the, the, the point number one. Don't, don't worry, I'm closing. It's not like point number one, we're just starting. Uh, we're all over the map. It's for, this for the people that track with points now. I did the, the shotgun method, and now we're going to do the point method down to the end. But um, So how do we overcome? Uh, is Jesus overcame as the Son of God, but by the Word of God. And so again, he overcame as the Son of God by the Word of God. And so Jesus was God in the flesh, and he easily could have rebuked Satan into some other galaxy to say, get out of here, be gone. But why didn't he? He he has that authority. But instead he resisted the devil in a way that we can imitate and identify with. He used the word of God. Every appeal the devil threw at him, he threw back the word. You know, it's almost like Jesus, in the 40 days he was out fasting and praying, it's almost like he was meditating because he on Deuteronomy. He actually appealed back with Deuteronomy every time, 6 and 8. He just re- it was like he was chewing. That was the spiritual food while he was out in, in, in the desert. And, and he just re- gave that back right at him. He knew the word of God. He knew how to rightly divide it, and he knew it. And that's our Savior. How much more should we know God's word as individuals? Like the, It's very obvious in this text that the devil knows the word of God. And just because someone quotes the word of God does not mean it's the word of God or it's taken in the right context. And so you've got to know how to rightly divide it. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 says that we should know the word of God so we can be readily um, able to divide it and, and, and to face things. Paraphrase. We need to know the word of God. We have to be able to, to acknowledge it and see that, man, the devil quotes scripture, and he's going to uh, try to con- convince us with traps in different ways, but we've got to know God's word. But what did we see Jesus do? He quoted the scriptures. He quoted Deuteronomy. And maybe Jesus had been chewing on it, like I said, uh, but he knew it. He understood 
uh, that Deuteronomy passage. So he, he came right back with every attack that when he attacked the word. He came right back with it. And, and even the word that um, Satan used was Psalm 91, and he twisted it. And, and, and Jesus could, could, could identify that. And so we see Jesus overcame temptation as the Son of God by the word of God. And I shared last week, I just recently started going through the Bible app on my phone. And um, I actually was encouraged by our pastor watching him teach one Sunday in the chronological order. Um, I'm on my iPhone. I got the Bible app. And every day, my three or four chapters, and it says you're on track. I just encourage you, just try something like that. For me, it's hard. I love old school word. I love my highlighter. I love my system. Uh, I love my cup of joe, you know, and stuff. But I love, I love this right now because I, I carry it with me everywhere. And I can just pop up, you know, in, in, in the courtroom today and read my, uh, my four, four chapters of Genesis and just loved it. Actually, I misquoted. I'm on three. I got to remember I'm not on track. I got one more to do tonight. Remind me. But that's not, the point's not to live by this law. But the point is just to, to, to absorb God's word so that you can be ready when the enemy attacks like our Savior was. And so how can we overcome like Jesus overcame? It says, number two, that's the last point. How can we overcome? Through the Son of God. We can overcome through the Son of God by the word of God. 